Natalia Foley presents History and Modern Tendencies in Dream Interpretation Part 1 This is my first page. Uh, everyone can see it? So, dreams, this is the topic that uh, interesting for everyone, for any layperson, for any professional, because what can be more interesting for us than uh, our own uh, dream interpretation. Dreams are also very important to us for many other reasons. And it's amazing how little we know about our dreams. Even today, with all our sciences, with all experiments conducted around dreams, we still don't know why we see dreams, what's the purpose of the dreams, how it's happening, and how to interpret it. We spent in sleep state about eight hours a day, which means one third of our life. Before, scientists believed that we see dreams only in our REM state of sleep. Then they said, no, sometimes we see dreams in non-REM state of sleep. Now, just recently, this year, French researchers, they said they're confident and they can prove it that we see dreams the moment we close our eyes and we get into sleep the whole duration of our sleep. So think about it. There is nothing accidental in our body. Every little cell in our body, every little lash, every little hair has meaning and purpose. Could it be accidental if we spent one third of our life in dreams and we don't know much about it? So let's try to discover what's happening when we're dreaming. Of course, when we are talking about dream interpretation and psychotherapy, we always will mention two names, Freud and Jung. However, it doesn't mean that before them there was no dream interpretation. Every single tribe, every single society, every single civilization, they had their way to interpret things. Not to mention fortune tellers that always monetize on dream interpretation. It's very interesting that Aristotle was considering dreams to be a life of the soul of the person when the person is asleep. So he considered dreams to be a separate life. Some other tribes, they've been considering dreams as a messages from either God or evil. A Chinese medicine, of course, they have their own concept of it, going from the holistic perception of their theory of yin and yang. They believe that the, those energies operating during our sleep and relieving uh, to us some kind of uh, inner wisdom. So regardless who was doing that, every single dream interpretation before Freud was based on the symbolic meanings of items that we see in our dream, that are present in our dream. There was always a discussion, how you interpret those uh, symbols? Is there any general rule to interpretation, how it should be attached to your particular cultural environment, to your spiritual orientation, to your religion? Should it be attached at all or not? Interesting that Jung actually said that there are no rules for dream interpretation. It is whatever you feel. So uh, maybe he was right. Maybe he was wrong. Let's see. Two of those guys, I wanted you to look at them because they are definitely represent huge, big names in a theory of dream interpretation, but they had an easy relationship between themselves. And those relationships predetermined in many ways their theories that we are having right now. I usually used to say that everything that is happening with the psychologist in his private and personal life and everything that is happening around him during the time when he's creating his ideas, everything that happening is affecting that particular person and his theory. And especially it is true and correct about Freud and Jung because historically they appear to be on two different sides of one problem, Nazism. The whole history of European civilization was rotating about the treatment of Jews. And it's important for us to understand, because based on that, we'll figure out how he was created, his theory of libido, telling us that libido is the biggest moving power in every human life, when in fact, he was not moved by libido himself. So this situation should be understood to evaluate his theory properly. At the same time, Jung was very attracted to the ideology of Nazis, which is unfortunately a black spot on his uh, 
theory and reputation and his life. There are many discussions about it, and there are many critics of uh, both of those guys, but they lived their life. They left the huge heritage for us, and we need to understand what it is and how to handle it from the prism of our dream interpretation today. I prepared the timeline for both of them. Um, there are two uh, slides with a different timeline, and I included into the timeline several people and several events, which I believe is very important for us to mention. First, there are people like Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, Karl Edgar Cayce. I hope you heard that name. You will yeah. ask him how it's related and why they are all together in that particular mix that I'm doing for you right now. Uh, Karl Marx was a theorist who was Jewish, of course, himself, and his theory was created as a retaliation for abuse and oppression of his uh, population, Jewish population in Europe. His desire was to destroy the society that was abusing and oppressing Jewish. Mm -hmm. And although in some of his writings, he was mentioning Jewish in a negative uh, way, so sometimes you might be really surprised, but it's nothing more than cover up. He wanted to destroy capitalism as it is because capitalism was preventing, at that time, was preventing Jewish people to practice particular profession, to uh, take some part in the society, to marry who they wanted. So they've been deprived of many, many, many rights. And as rebellious as Marx was, he created a movement that somehow helped at some moment Jewish people to feel better. And by the end of the century, the 19th century, when um, Freud was born and when he was going through his college and when he was establishing himself as a professional, Jewish population was kind of enjoying a lot of rights and a lot of uh, possibilities that they never had before. So he was able to go to the college. He was from a wealthy family. He uh, created a wealth for himself, but nothing was easy for him. Not a single day of his life. I wanted to read for you one little sentence when he wrote in 1873, when he was attending university at Vienna. On, he wrote, I found that I was expected to feel myself inferior and an alien because I was a Jew. So at his very early age, he was approximately 20 some at that time. He already faced that uh, persecution and he already had that fear is his heart because he was oppressed and the society didn't want to change and think about it. He needed to survive through this and he survived. And for him, his position regarding Judaism was the main core of all her activity, his activity. Throughout of his life, he was writing a lot of stuff about it. And every single time when he was mentioning his attachment to Jewish population, he was very conflicted in his writings. I want to give you one other sentence that he wrote. And it was done in 1925. You remember I put name of Hitler in that timeline. Why? Hitler wrote his main camp in 1925. It was published. And only in a few years after that, he will be a counselor of Germany and he will be implementing his theory. Main camp, I don't know if you ever read that book. It's actually disgusting. It's a, his autobiography when he's explaining and justifying why he became an anti-Semite and how he hates Jews and what is the solution. The solution, according to Hitler, just to physically exterminate them. So it was there. And this is the year when Freud wrote, my language is German. My culture, my attainments are German. I consider myself German intellectually until I noticed the growth of anti-Semitism prejudice in Germany and German Austria. Since that time, I prefer to call myself Jew. Do you hear some conflict here? It's like, I'm German, but um, nah, and a Jew, but I'm German. If you think about it, it's extremely painful. How it is for a person who is Jew, not to be able to be proud of who he is, not to be able to say, I'm Jew, and it, even though I'm uh, speaking German, he's doing it vice versa, which indicates that he was going through a lot of pain and a lot of fear. Because at that time, 
the whole Europe was going through a serious economical disaster. You know that America by the 30s was going through the Deep Depression, and the whole world was involved in economical crisis. Uh, Europe just get rid of the First uh, World War, where uh, every country was damaged, and every country uh, suffered financial uh, distress. So people were looking for the enemy who they can blame. And Germans found enemy right there. This is the Jew. You exterminate the Jew and your life will be better. So that was the uh, background of his existence at that point. By 1925, he already stopped his relationship with Jung. That was a huge, big part of his life. Why actually Freud and Jung met in the first place? Freud was the one who established psychoanalytic uh, society in Europe. Majority of the members of the association were Jewish, and he was afraid that if it would be all Jewish uh, membership, that this organization might be targeted and it will be destroyed. So he was looking for someone smart and someone who supports him that would be non-Jewish by origin, who can continue in his ideas. And he thought that Jung might be that kind of person. They meet first time in 1906, which was the beginning of the century. And they, their first meeting was 12 hours long, which you need because they've been exchanging ideas and it was instant spark. They believed in each other. They had a lot of similarities. They had a lot of um, common visions of different things. And it was amazing. So they agree to copyright in many ways. And in 1909, together, they came here to America for three months. And they've been touring America, giving their lectures in different universities and spending time together. And that was a critical time for both of them. It's very interesting that Jung, very critical of uh, Freud, on two aspects. He said that Freud made a mistake by not introducing any symbolic interpretation in his theory except sexual interpretation. He said that sexual interpretation cannot cover all possible variations of events in our life and libido is not uh, the most important moving power. Not only that, Jung said also that Freud's theory of subconscious is very limited. He said that uh, it's not even subconscious in the whole way how he sees it. He believes that the subconscious presented by Freud and his theory is so limited that it represents a like personal subconscious. And it's limited only to our past memories and our own thoughts, which Jung believed was a mistake. At that moment when that conversation was happening, Freud suddenly fainted away and fell unconscious. Imagine that. When he woke up, the thing that he said is shocking my conscience because he said to Jung, you wanted my death. How that idea of that coming from the words that Jung was using, he was criticizing, it was scientific conversation of two, two very smart and extremely intelligent people. And the way how Freud dealt with it and he perceived that critics, that the, the intent of you kill him is very telling. Why? The way how Freud created his theory had everything to do with his uh, uh, association with Jewish population because he knew, of course, that every single dream was interpreted before him from the point of view of symbolic meanings of some items in the dream. Why he didn't do it? Because if he will do it, he was afraid that he will be accused of propaganda of Judaism. In our mentality, in European mentality, in American mentality, we have Judeo-Christian system of values. They're coming from Ten Commandments that Moses received from God, and then it was accepted by the Christianity. So when we think about moral values in our life, regardless if you're atheist or agnostic or whatever, you will say that moral values would be something like don't kill, don't steal, don't cheat, and so on. This is Judeo-Christian system of values. And even if the Christian person will use those meanings and attach some symbolic items to those values, that person will not be persecuted in Europe at that time. But if Freud will be doing that, he was afraid that he will be accused of propaganda of Judaism. So he didn't do it. And instead, he put sexual symbols. And he said, that's it. That's, that's all there is. Why? because of the fear. 
fear was the basic moving power of Freud and motivational power of Freud throughout his entire life. And even when he was creating his theories, the same was with uh, unconscious. I don't believe that Freud with all his amazing right brain and ability to analyze things that he didn't know that unconscious is much deeper and much more than just our own life experiences. But he didn't made it connected with the spiritual um, web of thoughts because he was afraid of exactly the same thing. He was afraid that he will be accused of propaganda of Judaism. So his uh, inheritance that we have from him is so much limited only because of the fear that he was experiencing. Now, when Jung touched uh, that topic, the fainting away and saying you want me dead was inappropriate or uh, exaggerated reaction, which can be explained by only one thing, the fear and pain of being Jewish was so strong for Freud that I'm not even sure he was aware of that. Maybe he was blocking that. We will never know. We will never be able to ask him a question. But I wish I can because I want to ask him, Mr. Freud, why you tricked the whole entire population of the world into your libido theory when you knew it's not the most powerful motivation? You knew that. You've been moved in your entire life by fear. And I can prove that. In 1933, when Hitler came into power, there are agents of Gestapo running around with circles and measuring nose and ear of people walking on the street because they wanted to determine where Jews are and catch them and put them to the concentration camp. 1933, that was a year where the Howe concentration camp opened its doors. And behind the doors during the Second World War, 30,000 of people were killed. They lost their life. And 90% of that people were Jewish. That was the time when uh, Freud lived. He lived in Austria. And Austria was annexed by Germany in 1938. And same year. In a few weeks after Austria was annexed, youngest daughter of Freud, Anna, was arrested by Gestapo and interrogated. Freud used all his power, all his connections to get her out. And then immediately after she got out, he moved with the whole entire family to London, to England, running away from his motherland to save his life. In one year, he was dead. He was suffering from cancer, and he was going through enormous pain, and he was going through enormous shame of being Jewish and fear. There was so much fear that we cannot probably even imagine because the person who was fighting his entire life to stand his ground and saying, I'm German, but maybe I'm Jewish, but uh, I'm German because I speak German. And now he's running away and he's taking his entire family. I want to ask him right now, Mr. Freud, was it libido that moved you to London at the end of your life or it was fear? And if it was fear, why you told us that libido is motivational power in the human life? I'm not here to judge Mr. Freud. I'm here to explain what was going on and what was happening to him. Uh, Oh, by the way, on this slide, you can see picture. This is International uh, Psychiatric uh, Congress in 1911. In the center of that uh, picture, you can see Freud and Jung standing together. At that time, they were still in good relationship and they severed the relationship after their second conversation when Jung used the same arguments against Freud. And Freud again fainted second time. And when he woke up, guess what? He said, you wanted my dad. And that was the end of their relationship, relationship of two bright, amazing minds. And if there would be no Nazis or fascism in uh, that time, who knows how much amazing things they could invent and do together, but it didn't happen because at that time, Jung already was standing on the other side. He was involved in a Nazi people. He was uh, contributing into their ideology. And what is the most frustrating to know that his archetypes that we know in in his uh, theory, he misappropriated his archetypes from the Indian theory of yoga, which is true, because he was introduced to the Indian theory by Howard, who was uh, the author of uh, 
German faith movement. He actually wanted uh, that movement to be an official religious of the Third Reich. It didn't happen. Then he became a high position member of NSDAP and uh, was so enormously involved with those people supporting Nazi, doing everything for prosperity of the Third Reich. That is basically the cooperation between two of them were unfortunately at that time already impossible. On this picture, you can see Freud with his daughter, Anna, that uh, was arrested. From the point of view of um, business, I can say that Freud succeeded better than Jung in that particular area. The popularity of Freud is much bigger than Jung. Most of the practitioners, they are critical of Jung for two reasons, the same reasons that he was pointing attention of Freud to, because his system of symbols that he used for interpretation of dreams is uh, very artificial. It's not organic. It's not uh, relevant to the people living in his time and even in our time, because it's very narrow tailored to that uh, Indian philosophy that he was fascinated with, which is fine. But when you take something that is not reflective of the society where you having your clients, you don't expect your clients to follow. So he made a mistake. He wanted to fix Freud mistake that Freud didn't include symbolic interpretation, but he included symbolic interpretation that was so not responsive to the desires and expectations of his clients that it didn't work, basically. And second thing, he didn't go well uh, with the subconscious concept either. He was pointing to the mistake made by Freud. It was clearly true that Freud uh, made his subconscious concept very, very short of uh, deep meaning. But what uh, Jung did with the same concept, first he stole uh, the concept of Freud uh, that was subconscious, and he called it personal subconscious. And then he invented his own unconscious, which is rephrasing, and he made it a little bit bigger. He said it cultural collective unconscious. But collective unconscious was not understood by him and presented by him as connection, spiritual connection of uh, all people or something to that extent, he was specifically targeting the Nazi ideology and he was uh, promoting that through his writings and he believed that this is the collective uh, subconscious uh, that needs to be used as a ground for dream interpretation, which means all dreams coming from that ground. So that was the mistake that Jung did. Freud uh, was more successful perhaps also because sex cells and his theory of libido was fascinating and interesting and entertaining we know that there is some point in your practice when you sit in front of your client and think what else can i say so having libido at your disposal it's a wonderful topic for extended conversations with your client by saying that i'm trying to explain that i'm not judging through i want to share my own experience and the way why i see him the way i see him I feel for him. I have experienced this suffocating, constant feeling of fear for the entire duration of my life in the Soviet Union. I'm Jew. I am. I know what it is. I saw my mom dying, but not daring to accept the simple fact that she was Jewish. She died without accepting that. She learned the Georgian language. Georgia is a little country on the south of Russia. It's not the state of Georgia in America. So she learned the Georgian language. She married a Georgian man. She cooked Georgian food. And she was baptized in a Christian church. But that was not capable to invalidate the simple fact that she was as Jewish as it gets. That was her biggest shameful secret, she believed. And she was feared her entire life that that secret would be released. And I know that from myself. And that's why I understand. I understand what Freud was going through. But at the same time, I blame him for not having enough bravery to tell us the truth, that fear is the biggest motivational power of human behavior. But there is another thing very interesting. Besides that business factor, there is a, a lot of similarities among them. I want to give you some kind of demonstration of that by explaining how both of them came to their uh, theory of interpretation, how they even started to considering that idea. Both of them saw a dream. And for both of them, it was dream about their clients. Freud had a client. Her name was Irma, and she was not doing really well. 
So Freud was feeling a lot of guilt and he thought that he is a bad uh, psychoanalyst, he's doing something wrong, it's not uh, exactly working for her. And then he saw a dream. They've been together with that Irma at some party and uh, she was not feeling well. And he saw another doctor helping her by injecting something uh, into her body with a needle. And in his mind, he even saw the recipe of that fluid that was injected. And suddenly he realized that it's not the fluid, it's not his fault that she's feeling bad, but it's the needle because it's dirty. <laughs> and he felt enormous sense of relief because it's not, it's not his guilt. And after seeing the dream, he realized that the whole purpose of the dream is fulfillment of our wishes. Starting from that, that was his zero ground of developing his ideas. And he developed his uh, dream interpretation idea perhaps lying to himself. Because that dream that he saw is not about Irma. It's not about other doctor. It's not about other people on a party. It's about him. And the only thing that is relevant here is what he sees, the items. And if he saw a needle for injection, it's supposed to cause you pain. All he had in that dream, all he saw in that dream, he saw that he is in terrible fear for his life because he's Jewish and he feels guilt because he's high position and Jewish and he can attend whatever parties and uh, be in the lead of the society and other Jews are not so fortunate and all he wanted in his life to be relieved from that guilt in a way it would be fulfillment of wishes but it's not the wishes how he presented it so that was his dream, and that's where his theory started. The other dream that I want to present you, it would be Jung dream. He also was seeing his client. He was uh, working with her, uh, woman, of course, right? So he was working with her, interpreting her dreams. Everything was going fine. And at some point, the treatment was stagnating. They kind of reached some plateau, and they didn't move anywhere. And then he saw a dream that he's walking some nice valley. And if you've been in Switzerland, you can imagine such a beauty over there. So he's walking and there are some uh, hills and mountains. And on top of that mountain, there is huge tall castle. And on that castle, there is some patio. And that woman, his client, she's sitting over there and he's looking at her. That's the whole dream. So, so what he uh, get from this, he come up with the theory of compensation. Because he believed that uh, to be as snobby and arrogant as he was, <laughs> absolutely, he was looking down at that woman who was very intelligent. And if he will look up on her and recognize her intelligence, that will help. So he shared with her this dream and apparently their treatment started getting more beneficial to that woman. He interpreted mm -hmm. this dream that each dream supposed to be compensation for some shortcomings in real life. I don't know how you understand that concept. It's very far-fledged. It's maybe applicable to him. Remember, Jung said there are no rules of interpretation. It's whatever you feel. That's how he felt. But maybe he had to use some libido interpretation from his uh, friend, theory and think about uh, that uh, tall tower and high mountains as potential sexual symbol that he just desired that woman. But maybe because he didn't want to go that way, because he rejected Freud and generally, he come up with the idea of compensation and we come up with his theory of dream interpretation. However, theory is a theory. And when the theory cannot answer main questions in the field of particular phenomena, it might be not exactly accurate theory. And now we still have questions that no one of them answer. What is the purpose of our dreams? Remember, we dream one third of our life to get compensation or to get a fulfillment of wishes, which was all both uh, concepts are kind of wrong ideas based on very narrow, tailored, perception of life by two genius guys. So we still don't know what's the purpose of our dream. We still don't know what's the purpose of our sleep. We still don't know the answer to very important question, why some dreams we remember and some dreams we don't. 
And the most importantly, of course, we still don't know where our dreams are coming from. And if you tell me, they told you dreams are coming from uh, subconscious, I'll give you an example that no one of them would be able to explain. And that's why no one of them ever commented on it. So let's go to another slide. And here I mentioned three uh, guys. It's just three examples. When some unique, amazing, life-altering for the human civilization inventions were done during the sleep. The first guy, very interesting, is Elias Hove, who invented a sewing machine to sew dresses. He saw it in his dreams, basically. He was captured by some uh, barbaric tribe, and they asked him to invent a sewing machine, and if not, they will kill him. So he didn't invent it, and they start stabbing him with the uh, metallic sticks with some hole at the beginning of that stick. And they've been piercing and piercing his body in his dream, and that's how he realized that if you will take a needle, um, with the hole and put treat in it, and you will do certain particular movements, you'll get a sewing machine. That's how we got sewing machine in our history. Amazing. If our dreams are coming from our old memories, according to Freud and Jung, how would you explain that? And they didn't explain it. So the other guy that I want to mention is more recent, uh, James Watson, who invented structure of our DNA. Believe me, it's amazing discovery, and he received the Nobel Prize in 1962 for this discovery. What happened? He was seeing the dream, and he was seeing spiral staircase going up, and there was a thought that our DNA is perhaps like this spiraling staircase. And you know all this, those pictures of DNA that are spiraling up, right? So that's how it was invented, and he got the Nobel Prize. If is this coming from our old memories? How would you explain that? Mm -hmm. Then, um, Albert Einstein, Ein Einstein, right? He invented a theory of relativity. He saw a dream, very beautiful, nice dream, and he saw some cows by the fence. And suddenly, farmer put uh, electricity to that fence, and cows jump out of that fence. And uh, uh, Einstein saw those cows jumping simultaneously all together. And then in his dream, he saw the same cows through the eyes of farmer who saw them jumping back one by another. And he realized that your view of the event depends on your position. So easy. Theory of relativity was born in his dream. Amazing. How would you explain that? Unless there is something more than just our past memories. And I can give you example from my life. I really want to share it. I was five years old and I couldn't tie my shoelaces to save my life. I just couldn't. And I was blamed for it uh, in my kindergarten. My grandma was unhappy and I was uh, like nervous and struggling about it. And one night, I, I still remember that dream. I saw big hands and they've been tied tying the shoelaces and making a ball. And sure enough, I woke up and I did it. And I remember my happiness and it was amazing uh, feeling. Okay. Um, I put here a citation, I'm realistic. I expect miracles. To me, my dreams always been and still is a miracle and I love it and I live with it. So now I want to present you a story of another guy that is very important. Why? Because that guy was con uh, contemporary of both Freud and uh, Jung. And he was famous at that time. And his example is undebatable. The concept where our dreams are coming from, and you can know it's not coming from his past memories. Uh, let me give you a very short uh, story related to that guy. At the age of four, he received a serious, serious um, psychological uh, trauma. He saw his grandfather dying by drowning in the, the river. And after that, he had a lot of memory issues, and he was really bad student in his school, which was causing frustration of his father. Edgar couldn't remember a single word, and he was the worst uh, student in the class. One night, he was sleeping, and uh, he didn't see anything, but he heard a voice. Hearing voices in the dream, it's much more significant than uh, visual images. So he heard the voice, and the voice said, we'll help you. 
And next morning he woke up and he remembered the whole book of English language word by word. It was amazing. Then he was growing and um, nothing unique or amazing was happening to him. He became a photographer at the age of 23. He suddenly lost his voice. Like yesterday he was speaking and today he cannot say a thing and he's whispering. His parents were trying to bring him to any uh, possible available doctor. Nobody could say what it is. Nobody can diagnose uh, the disease and nobody knew how to treat it. So one day they had like traveling hypnotherapists coming through their town and they like, what the hell, we'll try. So they brought the little guy, not little guy, 23 years old guy, to the uh, hypnotherapist. And uh, during the state of hypnosis, Edgar started speaking in a normal voice. But then when hypnosis ended, he couldn't speak again. That was a promising moment because a parent realized that something, he, he's healthy and he can talk, but there is something that prevents him from doing that. And they started looking for another uh, hypnotherapist, maybe better. And they came to some famous at the time guy. Uh, they explained to him what happened. And he decided to use interesting technique with uh, Edgar. He placed him in the hypnosis state, like, you know, waving stuff again in front of his eyes. And uh, when he was in the hypnotic state, he asked him a few questions. He, the first question was, can you diagnose yourself? And Edgar started speaking in normal loud voice, a little bit mechanical, explaining that there is some area in his throat when uh, there is lack of um, blood access, and that's causing the issue. The second question the hypnotherapist asked, he asked him, please explain how that can be treated. And in his mechanical voice, he explained how it's supposed to be treated. And then hypnotherapist give, gave him an order and said, apply that remedy to yourself. And he said, I'm applying the remedy. And he did it throughout the hypnosis. Then he woke up and he was speaking. Everyone was shocked. Nobody could believe it, but it was real. It was something that was happening before their eyes. And then that hypnotherapist said, would you please do me a favor? I don't need your money, but I want you to treat a few of my patients. So uh, Edgar said, yes. And the uh, hypnotherapist brought some people with some problems, uh, medical problems. And then he was placing Edgar in that sleep state. And uh, he was diagnosing those people and he was giving remedies for them. And if you tell me that it was some genius um, inside, I'll give you another detail from uh, that uh, treatment. There was a specific case described very well in the literature. He was seeing someone and he said that the remedy should consist of that fluid, another fluid, and some kind of cream that is not available here, but it is available in the pharmacy in Il state of Illinois, a pharmacy on the cross of this and that street. And pharmacists forget about it. But on the third shelf from the top on the left side, there would be a jar that needed for that recipe. I should tell you that he was famous. He, as soon as he became famous, uh, our government became very interested, of course. Uh, he was the most recorded prophet of all times. Uh, his wife uh, and uh, his daughter and uh, some uh, agents from the government were reporting each and every prophecy revelation that he was doing. He was doing that only in his sleep state. And uh, when he was waking up, he didn't remember it. Too. He was very modest and very religious guy. And uh, that his ability was kind of causing him trouble with the church where he, that he was attending. But he is the real case. It's not something that uh, was in 19, uh, 16th century, whatever, 15th century, and we have some legends about it. This is the real guy with real records. They all belong to our government, and we don't know exactly what he predicted because it's still top secret. So he was contemporaneous of Freud and Jung. They didn't comment on him. Guess why? Because their theories couldn't explain that phenomena. And that phenomena is very telling. It tells us that in reality, our subconscious is larger than our past memories. 
it's okay. bigger than our life experiences and perhaps it's connected to the universe, in which way we don't know. What is interesting, I was reading some research by our physicists when they're trying to figure out where is conscious located. So they already figure out it's in our brain and they can even measure it, which is very important for the scientists. If they have something to measure, they're very happy. It's supposed to be scientific. So they measure our thoughts. They still cannot decode it. They cannot say what you are thinking, but they know you are thinking because our uh, brain uh, produces very uh, little uh, electric um, waves that can be uh, detected, but they still don't know where the subconscious is. We already found the conscious. It's a big progress. We still don't know where subconscious is. My guess is it's somewhere on the cloud, right? Because now we know the concept of the cloud. We keep our information over there and we access it wirelessly. Why our subconscious cannot work on the same principle. Uh, when I was discussing that with some of my colleagues, uh, they asked me a good question. They said, who, who owns the server? <laughs> and, I said, and I said, I have a wild guess. I think it's a god. <laughs> so, so now let's talk about uh, how the dream process can be actually explained. I, I apologize, guys. I, I know I'm talking already too long. If you are tired, I just need few more minutes than 15 <laughs> to finish that. So Can I suggest, uh, since we're going into a new thing and I want to have a, a fresh mind, I want everybody to have a fresh mind for this. Can we take a 10 minute break Absolutely. and come back and, and be refreshed and start up again? Is that Absolutely. okay? Let's oh. do that. The end of part one.